<laughs> oh, I wasn't ready for that noise. Hi everyone and welcome to my channel. I'm Simon of Savage Reads and this is the video I've been promising for quite a long time because I'm with Elizabeth McNeil. Hello. Who makes these and he's written an amazing book called The Doll Factory which we'll be talking about as we pot. My multitasking is interesting. It's so let's see great. how it goes. Yeah. Oh. So yeah, I oh, know that the first drop thrown. <laughs> that was. And what Elizabeth's going to, oh that's going too fast already. So yeah. at the moment I am just centering it. So it's one of these that you're going to try and do now? Yeah, so, so just getting the pot, the, the clay in the middle of the wheel. So it is the most boring part of it. So you basically just push it down and oh. pull it up. So. Why is it instantly almost a double on top of the So, question, my first question. Yeah. When did you know that you wanted to be a potter? Um, I think, because I love pottery so much, that I think it was really when my aunt, she makes these amazing pots, and I essentially couldn't afford them any longer because I bought so many. And I thought I would make my own instead, and I just really enjoyed it. So, there we go, the mug is taking see, form. This is happening here. I'm not even funny, that's, you've done that very quickly. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah. So, this is a very important pottery question. Uh -huh. This yeah. could be like a life or death question. Okay. How do you know when a mug you're making is good enough for tea? Because your mugs make a corking cup of tea. I feel a bit like Willy Wonka with all of these sort of secret trade secrets which I'm refusing <laughs> to divulge. But I think. But is there a science to making a tea that make? Uh, sorry, a mug that makes a good cup of tea? I think. I, well, I think that the the width of the clay is important. You don't want it to be too thin or it loses heat. I think that it needs to have a nice thin lip because that's comfy and sometimes if it tapers in a bit then it keeps it warmer for longer. Mm. Uh, hand, handmade mugs just do feel kind of different. Yeah. I don't know. So anyway, here is the mug finished. Hooray. Put and so fun. that took you less than five minutes. I mean, there are, there are other stages involved in the process, unfortunately, <laughs> but <laughs> it's not ready to drink from. <laughs> so. Can't think why yeah. we get on so well. <laughs> On a different question, yeah. when did you first know that you wanted to write? I'll, wheel, I'll take him off the wheel now and then I can throw another one. She's uh, gone. <laughs> yeah, maybe that wasn't the best of camera angles, just <laughs> my vanishing legs. Oh. I'll just pop it there, out of sight. Sorry, Simon. <laughs> right, I was saying when I knew I wanted to write. I think I've always wanted to write ever since I was a kid, in the, in the way that I think kids often do want to write because it's something that you know, books are tangible things and they're like, I would like to do this. Um, and lots of people grow out of it and I just didn't. And I always wrote loads of stories. Um, and then when I went to university, I started to take it more seriously and I got short stories published in a few anthologies and stuff like that. And then I sort of, yeah, my, my mum actually was very honest with me. She said, Elizabeth, you're a good writer, but it will be a very long time until you make any money from it. So make sure you don't just throw everything at writing, make sure you've got a career as well. Um, and she was right, um, even if at the time, if I'd known it would be 12 years until I got my book published, I probably would have given up because that feels like an incredibly long length of time for any 18 year old. But yeah, I'm pretty, it does, but then... now I am so glad, you know, that I kept, I kept writing and I kept setting that alarm for five in the morning and I kept writing those books that didn't go anywhere. And do you have like a drawer filled with books that I haven't gone anywhere that uh, you might go back to or I will never just... go back to them. Oh really? Yeah never because I feel like I've improved sorry Simon. <laughs> okay. I feel that I've improved as a writer so much that trying to revive something where it just didn't work would probably be a waste of time. Mine were like thank goodness and those publishers really had taste in not taking that book on because <laughs> So because these were, were full they, books? They were full books, but I wrote them when I was young. I wrote them when I was 23 and 25. And they were also books that I thought I was capable of writing rather than books which I, which reflected my reading interests. Okay. And that was, that was naive of me. I essentially just lacked confidence as a writer and I thought, what on earth do I have to say at the age of 23? Probably quite rightly. Um, so, some writers are able to write at such a young age and write brilliantly, but I was not one of those people. I needed to read more and I needed to live more. I think. You mentioned then that you, you were saying that you you needed to find out what you enjoyed writing but also yeah. do, is it, do you kind of write what you like to read? Yes, now I do but I didn't then. I idolised so much what I read that I felt like why would anyone 
read anything of mine when they could read Sarah Waters or Michelle Faber or something, so. I think everybody probably thinks like that. Yeah. Like Sarah Waters sits there and thinks that and she can't throw a pop. Oh, she might be able to. <laughs> she Sarah, might. let me I, know I bet in the she comments could. down below. Yeah. Send me a furious message. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Sorry. You've got to get Okay, I, I know, just one more, one more. And do you find yeah. this very therapeutic? Because it must um, be, if you're writing, is it a good place to come and do this? And think about what you want to do or it is because I listen I listen to loads of audio books and there's something incredibly mechanical about throwing pots where you kind of my hands are kind of doing stuff but your brain just wanders in a way that it doesn't if you're not doing anything if right. that makes any sense at all so yeah I think about I think about ideas a lot and I and I do calm down from when I'm like uh, you know I think every writer sometimes feels that they can't do it and their work the, the, their work in progress sort of isn't isn't there and so to come out here and throw pots, I sort of managed to calm myself down from those funks. And and usually once I've had a day for throwing, the next day, I know. It's the rage. It's like... <laughs> the rage. <laughs> yeah, I was just talking about how therapeutic I find it, ironically <laughs> enough. So going back to the doll factory, sorry, yes. I keep going off on, de on tangents. No, no. Detours, tangents, either, either or. Where did the idea come? Because. It's really hard, I think, to surmise the book. One, we can't talk about too much because of spoilers. Yeah. But we can say it's a historical novel. Yeah. Which is set around the Great Ex Exhibition. Yeah, 1851. Why, why did you decide to write about the Great Exhibition? So um, what, what came to you first, actually, with The Doll Factory? Uh, Ignore all those questions. Okay. So um, I, wanted, I wanted to write about a pre-Raphaelite artist because, I don't know, I've always, I've always been quite interested in particularly the women in the pre-Raphaelite movement. Um, and whenever I've sort of seen the paintings like Ophelia and Tate Britain or something, or, I've always sort of wondered who, who are the women behind those paintings because they are so striking. Mm. And so I sort of, I thought a lot about that and whether I'd write a fictionalised biography of Lizzie Siddle, um, who used to work in a bonnet making shop and then was spotted by, by Walter Deverell and his mother who were shopping for a bonnet and then she end up, ended up marrying Rossetti and becoming a painter. And I sort of wanted to write about her but I also and I, I did so much research around her but then I found myself kind of constrained by her the fact that she did live and sort of you're straddling this strange place between um fact where you have to stick so closely to the facts of her life and you can't be imaginative with the plot um and also the things you do imagine are her emotions which is a private world which I found I found that's I found I wasn't comfortable writing it, but that doesn't mean I don't love fictionalised biographies and reading them. Mm. Like Age of Life, for example, it's amazing. Like Wolf Hall, incredible. Would you say, in a weird way, that therefore, whilst you are writing a historical novel and have written yeah. a historical novel, you were slightly hemmed in by history because it had to be, it had to have its narrative that was already foretold. Um, Gosh, in I've terms, just got deep. <laughs> in terms of the biography, I found that I found that too much. Mm. Um, in terms of, because it's is it fiction, is it biography? Yeah. But I did really enjoy setting a novel in like the world of the pre-Raphaelites, where I don't have interiority into any of the real figures, even though they have cameos like Millie and Rossetti. Mm. Um, so I like that and being able to sort of I used Lizzie Siddle's trajectory because Iris starts off working in a doll making shop and then she finds herself sort of catapulted into this bohemian world of artists. So that sort of, that was my sort of nod to Lizzie while I was also then able to kind of manipulate the plot. As you're reading, initially I was thinking, oh, this is like a um, big sort of historical rompy love story and then it gets dark. Yeah, yeah. And I really enjoyed writing the dark stuff. And I also really liked the Victorian era for that because, you know, on the one hand, you've got this sort of, the very plight veneer of society. Um, and then underneath it, you've got all of that darkness and the squalor and the poor social conditions. And you've got like Albie, who's a little street urchin who doesn't have any teeth. And you've got, you know, um, he, his sister's a prostitute and the streets have shit on them. And, you know, and all, all of those. All of Victoriana. Yeah, all of it, Victoriana kind of... in all of its different levels. Mm. Like even the Great Exhibition at the top, that's like collecting it, it's sort of legitimate. Then and then you've, you've got, got this Silas. Gory detail as well, which I love. Yeah, yeah, Silas who is... And then is... Silas who's like the kind of, um, I don't know, he's he's the less legitimate, less established version of that kind of collecting impulse. And then the Royal and Academy. A <laughs> and, and a psychopath. I'm not going to say more than that. <laughs> no, we, we, we shall not give spoilers. But, but if you like books with psychopaths in, 
Jake. I loved writing it in a very alarming way. The way he said that of me, I was like... Yeah, no, I just looked at you really intensely as well. I'm going to end up in a pot. Oh my god, that's so dark. In the kiln. <laughs> Fired. So we're on mug three now. We are. Which is frankly sure enough. Uh, <laughs> where did where did Silas come from? So that was that was the part missing part of brain. my idea. My brain, I know, which is the most alarming thing of all. So, so that first first part was the pre raphaelites which was rattling around my head for ages. And then I went to visit this really weird um, shop of curiosities in Hackney called Victor Wynne's Museum of Curiosities. And oh my gosh, it was like conjoined stuffed kittens and a taxidermy lion and a human skeleton under a table and it's so weird and it's, it's in this basement and I just thought you know what kind of mind curates that and I just became really interested in the idea of collecting and that kind of sign then I, I, I tried to write him as a modern day collector and then I was like hang on a second he lives in Victorian London where the Great Exhibition is being built and he provides the artists with the taxidermy creatures with their mm. paintings. And that is the link. And then it, as soon as I got that, I was like, and Lizzie Siddle is Iris, a fictional doll-making apprentice. And it kind of all just slotted into place. And then I got Albie as the kind of thread linking the two of them. And He's yeah. a brilliant character, Albie. Oh, he was, he's fun to write as well, because um, he's got really short chapters. And he kind of just lives in the present moment. He doesn't have much interiority, at least at the beginning. And he doesn't yeah. have any flashbacks because he's just thinking about what he's doing then. Yes, I'm doing and, that. Um, and that was, that was fun to write as well because, you know, you've just got a character and they're just all about momentum. And, yeah, just... I write like a pot. Like a pot. Do you see what I did there? <laughs> he's a did. genius. Yes. <laughs> One question I want to ask you is your characters, your sisters, because there is a, there's a relationship between sisters and I find yeah. sibling relationships fascinating oh me too i am fascinated in the relationships between siblings and the idea that they can become suddenly toxic and claustrophobic mm. and the goblin market the rossetti christina rossetti poem which i quote in the novel was kind of an inspiration for them um because it's about two sisters and it's sort of the goblins kind of corrupting one of them and i just yeah i find the bond between sisters where where it's unconditional and i thought what happens when it's sort of unconditional, but something snaps. Where, where jealousy, particularly if in, in the Victorian society where beauty was your currency, mm. and then you know lack of vaccinations, sort of smallpox, could ruin someone's beauty like that. And if that was her means of escaping the situation she was in, marriage, which is sort of what conventionally it would have been, then yeah. where did that leave her? And where did that leaving leave her feeling about her sister? Well, also because, and it's one of the things that I find kind of fascinating about the, the dynamic is that yeah. her sister was this beauty, but also who had been slightly foolish. I won't give any more away than that yeah. in what she'd done. And, and one of the things that you do look at a lot in the book is women's, the expectation of women in society. And yeah. the fact that, you know, they aren't even, you know, they, they aren't seen as creative, they aren't seen as artists, they aren't seen as, well, they're merely seen as sort of men's toys yeah yeah and even the time Dolls, the doll factory if, you will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if only i thought of that <laughs> no no exactly exactly sorry that sounded really sarcastic and well, whereas, it's you know, that's a, well no no because, because lots of <laughs> and it's really about it's about women and how they were seen and all of these pre-raphaelite painters creating these kind of these beautiful wan women staring out of their mm. sort of caged frames it looks at how women are confined and I guess if there had been uh, if you had kind of written it from Lizzie Siddle's perspective then it would have been even more confined in the fact that history had already decided what was going to happen there yeah yeah um and her incredibly tragic end and Rossetti digging up her corpse seven years later to retrieve the book of poems he'd buried with her so romance romance <laughs> How did you know, or how did you go about yeah. putting the light and shade throughout the book? Um, and like, do we I, ever think, you know, this is too dark or...? Yeah, there were times where, where I did feel like I needed to pair it back. And there are definitely some lost taxidermy scenes where I thought this is... Well, actually my editor was like, this is too much. And she was right. It was a difficult one to balance. Um, 
because I, I and also Silas as a character I wanted him to have moments of joy as well so even if the the, the gap between how he sees himself and how the reader would see him it's, it's so even sort of the more psychopathic elements still have like moments of light <laughs> spliced through them maybe I don't know glitter chucked on them yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's a little bit of joy yeah um, wrap, wrap up his weird macabre obsession to the ribbon and, <laughs> and it's not dark at all <laughs> final so. question for this video Yes. As you finish off this part. As I know, time it's is seamless. So well. um, yeah. Why do you think we remain so fascinated by the Victorian era? Um, I think because it wasn't that long ago and it was such a, it's such a different society, I think, in, in, in many ways. In some ways it's more similar than I think we give it credit for. But I think that just, I think the morality of the era is kind of, fascinating for us the different the shade and the light of it that, which we were talking about earlier and kind of the different levels of it and just and it was also the the age where sort of industry on a greater scale and mass manufacture and it was just it was just an an age of so much change but also so much backwardness too and to how patriarchal it was and stuff so arguably more so than the century before it and you know so i, I think I think there's just so much to explore in it. I just think there are just so many levels and... Yeah, I think know, it is as well. It, it that is kind it. of repression, but also the way repression was expressed in kind of a dark and sordid and mm. veiled like, way. I, I love the fact that they had that language of flowers where you would send flowers to people if you'd stay at their house and if they're fox it's basically saying, I've got a curse on you. But it was a, like oh a, my a gift. Yeah. Um, but I think also what you're saying, I think is completely right because I'm love the Victorian era and yeah. I think it's the fact it was so near but it seems yeah. so gothically different and yeah. distant but actually with so much weird stuff yeah. like the morning brooches of people's hair and you know the memento mori for photography and yeah. stuff like that just you know well I was a tour guide at Highgate Cemetery and the things <gasps> that you learned oh my god I'm so jealous mm, it was, a good, oh, it was wow. a good yeah it was a good one but I think anyone who loves anything Victorian if you yeah. love um, romp about art, but also a romp about love, but also a gothic Victorian thrilling book, then you need to get your mitts on the doll factory. Oh, thank frankly. you, Simon. That's a lovely way to end this video, yeah. but in the next video, he's going to gonna teach me how to throw a strop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's starting to spin. Oh, God. That's you creating its bottom. Oops. Cheeky. <laughs> Literally cup the cup. Yeah, cup the cup. <laughs> Do that. I don't know what I'm doing. How does a sponge work? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay, careful. Stop the spinning. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. No. Oh my gosh.